Yeah, so we estimate that uh, the earthquake was magnitude 6.6. .6. It struck early in the morning on February 9th, 1971. So going on 50 years ago. Um, it was close to the town of Silmar, the epicenter. It, it was a thrust fault. So we have the San Gabriel Mountains here in, in the Southern California area, and they are essentially being pushed up right now along thrust faults that run along the base of the mountains. And the whole LA area is kind of being squeezed uh, by plate tectonics forces. And when you squeeze, when you squeeze an area, things have to go up. So um, the earthquake, the mountain side essentially went up a couple of meters um, in that earthquake. And um, a lot of people make a distinction between a rolling quake and a shaking quake. And I've heard really there really isn't um, that type of thing that goes on. But you tell me, what, what basically uh, happened with this quake? Yeah, so magnitude is one number that tells you the overall size of an earthquake. How big was the fault and how much uh, the fault that moved and, and how far did it move? Um, you can think of an earthquake as a symphony, as a musical orchestra that is releasing energy over a whole range of tones. So an earthquake will have booming low tones, which is the, 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 the booming energy, and then it has the jittery high tones. And any earthquake releases that whole symphony of, of shaking. And what you feel depends on a couple things. The bigger the earthquake is, the bigger the symphony. So you have low tones and high tones and everything. Um, quite strong. But then a lot of things control what you actually feel at any one place. Uh, in particular, how far away you are. From the, from the earthquake. So if you're right on top of it, you get the whole, you get the whole orchestra coming down on you all at once, um, all of the energy. If you're farther away, the jittery high tones start to damp out as they travel. And what you're left with is those booming, ro rolling low tones. So uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but the farther you are, you are away from an earthquake, the more it tends to feel like a roller because the shaking part has died out along the way getting to you. Gotcha. Now, what about the sound? We have a lot of people that said that it sounded like a freight train. Uh, personally, I mean, I was a senior at Silmar High School at that time and living in Silmar. So I guess um, based on where it was, I was pretty close to the epicenter. And I don't remember a sound. I just remember being shaken like crazy. Yeah, I was in um, Southern California for the Northridge earthquake, which was similar in 94 to what Silmar was. And one of the things that struck me from that earthquake was how loud it was. Um, and that one hit at 4.31 in the morning. People may remember that one. Um, but thinking back, the sounds that I heard were mostly the built environment around me. I, it sounded like glass breaking. It sounded like transformers exploding. The house was shaking. Um, all of that was going on. And if there was any noise from the ground itself, I didn't notice it. Um, so in 71, if you were close to the earthquake, I imagine it was the same deal. You were hearing a lot of things around you shake and explode. But, and I talked about how earthquakes are sort of a symphony. Uh, some of the energy that earthquakes generate when the fault moves are essentially sound waves moving in the ground. Uh, the P wave. If people know about P waves and S wave. The P wave is essentially a sound wave that's in the earth. And when that gets to the surface, in some circumstances, if the earthquake's big enough, it can actually generate a sound wave in the air. So you're essentially hearing the P wave. Um, and that's, that energy is going to damp out pretty fast as you move away from where the earthquake is. But if you're close to it and the, the the shaking is strong enough, you actually are hearing the, hearing the earthquake itself. Well, that, that's interesting because you actually are hearing the ground and the earthquake make that noise and it's not just the things that are around you falling on top of you. Yeah, yeah, it can be, it can be the ground itself. And the length of time, now, uh, we get people tell us, you know, oh, golly, it lasted 60 seconds, it lasted 30 seconds. Uh, it, you know, and I guess if, if it actually lasted 
60 seconds or two minutes, the devastation would be much, much greater. But uh, with Somar, what was the length of time of the initial shock? Yeah, that's a tricky question because the earthquake, uh, there's a patch of fault that moved. And 6.6, .6, I actually don't have the number off the top of my head, but it was on the order of 30 seconds that the fault was actually in motion. It wasn't all that long. But once the fault moves, it, it's generating energy that's being sent into the, into the earth in all directions. And that energy starts to bounce around. Um, it takes a while to, to travel. If you're living in the San Fernando Valley, um, which is essentially where the earthquake was, it's, most people know it as the San Fernando Valley, or the LA Basin, that energy gets trapped in the valley or, or in the Los Angeles Basin and it starts to slosh around. So what you feel at any one place, it's not just the fault moving, it's that energy leaving the fault and then bouncing around in all sorts of complicated ways. So it might have lasted for any one observer. It's hard to say um, exactly how long it would have lasted, but it, 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 it makes sense that it's going to vary from place to place. And which particular fault was this and how close was that to San Andreas? Oh, gosh. What was the name of the fault? Uh, was it San Fernando Fault? You know, that's so... <laughs> I should have that off the top of my head. But, um, there's essentially a thrust fault system along the base of the San Gabriels. Um, and it has, it has different names al along different places. But it's essentially the same fault system that, that is at the base of those mountains at the, along the southern front. And it's, it's how those mountains are being pushed up. If people know the Los Angeles area, that fault system is at the southern edge of the San Gabriel Mountains and the San Andreas is at the northern edge. So there's the San Gabriel Mountains in between San Fernando, you know, the San Fernando Valley and, and the San Andreas. And that, that distance varies depending on exactly where you are, but it's on the order of tens of miles. So uh, it was not exactly uh, really close to the San Andreas, but it was close enough uh, that it didn't trigger the San Andreas, did it? No, so the San Andreas north of Los Angeles has not had a big earthquake since 1857. Um, and, you know, people, people have been worried about it for a while, and eventually we, we know it's going to have more big earthquakes, but we haven't seen them in, in recent times. Just to geek out a little bit, the, the energy that people hear is a frequency of 30 hertz and above. And so that's at the very upper end of the range that earthquakes generate. So um, you need a big earthquake close to somebody before you get that kind of high frequency shaking. And it's not something, the audible part of it is not something that we sort of record in general. And we're recording what's happening to the ground. So to try to generate, it, it's hard to generate earthquake sounds um, or to capture them. Uh, one of the things that, that came up uh, quite often, and I don't remember it because uh, it, it just it never dawned on me, although I've done interviews with uh, so-called earthquake experts uh, in my uh, in my reporting career uh, that talked about this particular um, uh, phenomena, if it is a phenomena, and, and you tell me, uh, regarding supposedly there was a full moon that night. <laughs> and uh, first of all, if, I don't know if you remember if there were, or had any recollection of if it was, but whether it did or didn't, uh, is that does that have any effect on uh, earthquakes or, or what happens here as far as earthquakes? I know it has effects on the tides, but uh, does it have any effect on earthquakes? There have been studies showing that tidal forces can modulate earthquakes occurrence at a very low level. So in a place that you have a lot of little earthquakes, you might get slightly more, uh, especially if they're shallow, Correlating with the tides, but I actually wrote a paper a few years back looking at whether the biggest earthquakes, magnitude eight, going back through time, have, have they occurred at any, preferentially at any point in the lunar cycle? And the answer is no. Um, there's no pattern. 
Um, so what happens is earthquakes, if, if they happen on the full moon, people remember that. Um, but a, a, lot, a lot of them don't. So at least as far as we understand, it is just a coincidence when, when they occur through the lunar cycle. What about the aftershocks? Uh, I know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Somar was a 6.5, right? 6.5, 6.6. Um, and then we had the aftershocks that came, obviously aftershocks get less, lesser and lesser and lesser as time goes on. But we had some pretty big ones right after that. Uh, and what were some of the, the larger aftershocks that, uh, that we had? You know, I don't know off the top of my head what the largest was, but I did hear a story that the rule of thumb in seismology is that once you have a main shock, the largest aftershock on average is one unit smaller. So you would expect for a six and a half in California, you would expect a five and a half aftershock. And I don't believe Silmar had an aftershock that was quite that big. Um, it would have had fours and, and low fives. Um, they would have felt plenty strong if they were occurring close to where where people are, a magnitude five can feel like a really good jolt, as you know, if, you, if you're right on top of it. Um, there was actually concern um, that there might be a five and a half or bigger. Uh, the Van Norman Dam had been damaged and there was concern that a, a really big aftershock could damage it further. Um, and that didn't happen. So, so Silmar did not have any especially big aftershocks, which was a which was a blessing. You uh, jump to the my next question actually, and that's the Van Norman Dam. Um, <laughs> the Van Norman Dam, um, there was some, some damage, and of course they had to evacuate eighty thousand people. Uh, they got water out, or got the water level down to uh, a, a level that you know obviously it didn't break. Oh, what were the um, what were the issues involving the uh, Van Norman Dam as far as uh, was the dam construction not that great? Was it earthen or, or what was the problem there that caused this major concern? One of the issues with the Silmar earthquake um, was that it was surprising scientifically. Um, there's been a long debate going back to the, the turn of the last century about how strong earthquake shaking can be. And before the 1933 Long Beach earthquake, engineers had estimated that the peak shaking, the peak acceleration was only gonna be about 0.1 G. So G is people call it the G forces. The, um, it's not really a force, it's the acceleration that gravity causes. But if you think of in terms of G-forces, what that means. Um, as of 33, people thought that the, the worst acceleration would be 0.1 G. And then Long Beach came along and generated a third to a half G. So people realized that shaking could be stronger. Um, but as of 70, 71, the thinking was that shaking wouldn't ever get stronger than about one third of G. Um, and so things had been designed accordingly. This is how strong we think the ground is going to shake. We're going to build them to withstand that. And Silmar came along and there was a recording from Pacoima Dam um, in, the, in the mountains not too far away that recorded 1.7 G, so nearly 2 G. Um, and that was eye-popping um, that the earth had generated a shaking that had been that strong. So that actually sparked, that was the recording that sparked a thousand, launched a thousand ships and people trying to understand it, explain it. Um, there was a lot of, of work done try, that basically explained it as kind of a fluke. Um, but the basic point is that Silmar came along and shook the earth in general, much more strongly than anyone had thought possible. Was that because of the location? And I mean, because it was really along the base of the San Gabriel Mountains, or was that for some other reason? So the really, um, 
one of the things we've learned in time is that earthquakes, even in magnitude six and above, can generate really quite strong accelerations. So 1G, you know, getting up to 2G, really very strong. But those kind, that kind of uh, ground motion is occurring only right on, if you're right on top of a, a good sized earthquake. So all the seismometer recordings that we've had, you know, that there, we don't tend to have recordings right on top of, of big earthquakes. They tend to be at some distance away. So it's just a matter of not having good data to know what's going on very close to a fault. And since 71, as, as we've gotten more and more recordings close in, we, we understand that, yeah, the, the shaking levels can get, can get quite high. It wasn't that Silmar was, was that unusual in any way. We just hadn't seen any big earthquakes up close like that. Have, uh, did Northridge generate more as, uh, compared to what Silmar did? Um, Northridge and Silmar were fairly similar earthquakes in terms of magnitude. They, were, they weren't too far apart. Um, they were recorded on different instruments. So the 1.7G at Pacoima Dam, that is, that's one of the strongest uh, shaking levels that's been recorded. Northridge was recorded on, um, on its own set of instruments. Uh, some of them had quite high shaking levels also. Um, so overall, they were, they were fairly comparable earthquakes in terms of their size and the, the shaking that they generated. Oh, uh, we uh, spoke earlier, and you mentioned something to me that I want to get into, um, because that is the situation at the McDonald's. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what you learned uh, about and from uh, the situation at the McDonald's uh, parking lot on Glenoke Boulevard. So at one point, I set out to go look for faults in the in the LA area and in California in general. But in Los Angeles, you know, for, for all that we hear about earthquakes and faults, and that's my, my professional life, um, I don't deal with faults in the ground per se, I deal with earthquake data. So one point I set out to find places in Los Angeles area where you can actually see faults, you know, where, where they've moved the ground. And it, it's a little trickier than you might imagine to, to go find, find, find faults. They're not, it's not like the Hollywood movies where you have these great chasms in the earth. So I went looking for the, the Silma rupture because it, it wasn't that long ago. Um, and most of it is along the, the base of the mountains. And that gets obscured pretty quickly over time because, you know, you have rainfall, you have what we call the scarp. So the ground was pushed up, but then it kind of falls over and stuff comes down on top of it. So that's notoriously hard to find. Um, but part of the fault break from Silmar actually, it's, it's hard to do, show this um, on the screen, but it actually continued west under the, the valley, the flatlands. So through part of the flatlands, the ground went up um, like that, and you had this fault scar. And that cut across roads, it cut across yards. Um, and then over time, so things go up, and then the nose kind of falls down. So you get something that looks like that. Um, but if over, it got smoothed out over time. You know, people came along and smoothed out the roads. Um, but then I came across this one intersection, uh, well, the McDonald's near an intersection where the fault clearly moved, um, it created the scarp, and then they must have come along after the fact and built a parking lot on the upper side of the, the scarp and the restaurant itself on the lower side and they landscaped the fault in between. So if you go there today, it's this nice little hill, it's nicely landscaped, and that's actually the fault break from the, the 1971 earthquake. And people, people now, mostly, they have no idea that, that that's where the earthquake broke through. That's why this, this little hill is there. I want to talk about the, uh, the importance of um, Somar. Um, in, in, our, in our research for this, and 
uh, the comments we've had back and talking to first responders and people who were um, uh, involved in the aftermath of it, uh, we've learned that, you know, like we thought, that Somar was one of the more important seismic events of the 20th century, if not the world, and especially for California. And, you know, we had the CERT program come out of it. We had Urban Search and Rescue. And you told me that um, we also had um, some other national uh, stuff that came out of this. I wonder if you can explain that a little bit. Yeah, I think Sulmar really was, it, it definitely was one of the most pivotal earthquakes in, in U.S. history for a couple reasons. And one was the shaking that I talked about, that it really was an eye-opener for, for how the ground can shake when an earthquake happens. Um, but the other has to do with the context of the earthquake. So when Los Angeles grew as a population center starting around 1900, we saw the Long Beach earthquake, which sort of settled a debate over whether or not there was earthquake hazard in Los Angeles. So that, after 1933, we did have, um, we did have building codes. We knew that earthquakes could happen we still had this you know, kind of off-base sense of how strong the, the ground could shake. But then in the 1940s, there were a couple of little earthquakes, like one down in Torrance in 1941. But then just by chance, the LA basin got quite quiet. And there were hardly, there, was, there wasn't an earthquake as large as magnitude five after the early 1940s for several decades. And Los Angeles, grew enormously during that time and people people locally weren't too weren't too worried about earthquakes and it just it was we hadn't had any reminders so Silmar came along and just smacked the area in, in the face of you know a large earthquake um, that really underscored the, the degree of damage in, in Southern California but if you go look at even the larger context um, in recent times, people know the U.S. Geological Survey and, you know, the, the fact that we put out uh, earthquake websites, seismic hazard maps, I mean, that didn't exist before the 1970s. Before 1976, there was no federal program that was focused on earthquake hazard assessment and risk reduction. And starting in the 1960s, uh, earth scientists and engineers realized that it really should be a, a governmental function to, to look at earthquake hazards. Um, and so there started to be a push for, for a federal program. Uh, the, Good the 1964 Good Friday earthquake uh, struck in Alaska. So that was on American soil, although it was you know, some distance away from most people. Uh, and that got a ball rolling with, with a group of scientists uh, led by Frank Press, who some, some, some of your viewers might recognize as, as Jimmy Carter's later uh, science advisor. But Press and other leaders got together and started to come up with plans for a federal program. Uh, Alan Cranston was a, a strong supporter. He had a colleague in Ohio, I'm forgetting his name, who was, who was working with him. And they were trying to enact this, this legislation. Um, and there were, it didn't happen overnight. Um, and typically, these things take, take a while. Um, and then Silmar came along and it was an example of what's at stake with, with earthquake risk. And you have, Los Angeles was, you know, the city of the future back then. I visited um, as a kid to, to, visit my, to visit my grandparents who lived in the high desert and you flew, fly into this glitzy uh, futuristic airport and you know, the pa soaring palm trees. And, um, you know, to have an earthquake hit Los Angeles collapse a fairly new hospital building, damage another one, um, within the contiguous United States, that really communicated to people what, 
what was at stake and what earthquakes could do. And it, it really spurred the, this, this effort that had been underway to, to launch the federal program. And it still didn't happen right away. Um, there was a lot of work behind the scenes and uh, bills that, that didn't pass. But um, the stars aligned as of 1976. We had Jimmy Carter in the White House, who's a, you know, an engineer with an appreciation of science. And what was called NEHRP, the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, was finally signed into law in, in 1976. And that's the program that's given us all the, all the stuff that we, that we know and you know, rely on for earthquake information today. The similarities to Northridge, and we've seen a few charts regarding fires uh, and uh, after the earthquake. And, uh, and it seemed that these two quakes were extremely close but I'm, I'm curious as to, were they on the same fault lines or were they on the, on the same, what were the similarities there um, as far as geographic side of it? Yeah, so they were, they were quite close. Um, they were quite similar in terms of magnitude and obviously location. So I talked about this fault system that runs along the base of the, the San Gabriel Mountains and most of, if you can picture, you know, the mountains like this, most of the faults are coming up at an angle. So when they break, the, the mountainside goes up. Um, and that's what we saw in Silmar. And Northridge was a little bit of a surprise. It, it, um, it was on the same, broadly the same fault system. But it turns out that the faults are, are more complicated than the, the cartoon images. And so you have the mountains, you have the faults like this. You also have some faults at depth that are like that, that you don't see because they don't reach the surface. And Northridge actually happened, so the Silmar Fault, if it was dipping this way, the Northridge Fault was going the other way. And it was a fault that didn't break all the way to the, didn't extend all the way to the surface. So Silmar, the, the earthquake actually moved the fault all the way to the surface. That's why the, the McDonald's went up, the mountains went up. Northridge did not. There was no place after the Northridge earthquake where you could actually see where, where the fault had, had broken. It was all at depth. After an earthquake or any kind of natural disaster like this, building codes change. Uh, it's natural fact of life. Politicians get really involved. Uh, people who um, kind of poo pooed the possible event realize, oh my gosh, guess what? Mm -hmm. Um, the building codes that changed after Silmar, I wonder if uh, you might uh, talk about that a little bit uh, to the best of your knowledge. Yeah, so there, there has been this process, you know, the, this dawning of, of this realization that of how strong the ground can shake during an earthquake and this evolution of thought. So we started out 1930, people thought a tenth of a G was the limit. And then after 1933, we thought a third of a G was, was the limit. And so building codes have been designed according to scientists' estimate of how strong the ground is going to shake. Um, and so as earthquakes have happened and, and revealed that the shaking can be stronger, then it's not necessarily that the building codes were inadequate given the level of understanding at the time, it was that the level of understanding was, was flawed. So, um, and then there's some other issues, you know, people have come up with designs over time that were thought to be earthquake resilient, um, that turned out not to be. Uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to really test a full scale building if you, you've got a design and in theory you think it's earthquake resilient, well, there, there may be issues that you, you can't really, that you don't really understand. Yeah, over, over time, going back to, to really the early um, 20th century, earthquakes have just, as they've occurred, they've shown us more about how the ground can shake and that spurred this process of building code development um, 
And sometimes the earthquakes reveal surprising vulnerabilities. The Northridge earthquake um, revealed some vulnerabilities with steel frame buildings. They were a little bit surprising. There were welds in steel frame buildings that had been designed and tested and they failed. And it revealed some, some flaws in the, in the actual welding process. So, um, you know, earthquakes are a real world test of engineering theories. And um, sometimes they do, they do reveal surprises. I know one of the things that uh, we learned from Silmar that repeated itself, so I guess we didn't learn it all the way in um, Northridge, uh, was the, the pancaking effect. Uh, the um, evidently, well, I know with all of you, it had been certified uh, 30 days before the quake because it was a brand new hospital. The um, Veterans Hospital was built in the 1920s and it had um, lack of support, adequate support on the ground floor, which caused the pancaking. And then, of course, we had the same thing happen in Northridge, where we had the parking structure in Northridge that collapsed. Uh, I wonder if you, uh, could you address any of that? Um, yeah, there are, and as building codes evolve, you do have the problem of existing structures that were built to built to older codes. So you do have sometimes structures that we know are vulnerable, but it's difficult to come back in and retrofit a structure. It's, it's, it tends to be extremely expensive. Um, and it can be hard to find the resources to, to tackle that. Um, and especially, you know, you think about going back to the context, 1971, Los Angeles hadn't seen a big earthquake in in nearly 40 years. Um, so there's always, there's always budgetary priorities. There's always a competition for resources. And there hadn't ever been the political will to find the money to, to go back and, and retrofit a, an older hospital. The one thing that happened after 1933 was that California um, enacted the Field Act, which it's not a building code per se, but it it's very strict requirements for the construction of K through 12 public school buildings in California. So any school built after 33 um, had to be built to very strict standards. And that's been a, a success story that school buildings, uh, almost everything in the state is, um, has been built to Field Act standards. And the older buildings, they had to, um, not right away, but over time, uh, the K through 12 schools had to move out of them if they weren't Field Act compliant. So at least that, I think California has done a, a very good job with that. I know that uh, Somar High School, we have pictures of a lot of the damage, and I, of course, I remember a lot of the damage, but I don't remember any buildings collapsing, although some of the, um, it, it, and it became the advent of the bungalow uh, became the next big thing that uh, happened there because they had to bring on portable classrooms while they uh, fixed uh, or you know retrofitted or at least um, fixed the the existing buildings that were not safely inhabitable. Yeah. So, and if you have a well-built school building, you can still see some damage. Um, the, uh, if people remember the Ridgecrest earthquakes last year um, in the little town of Trona, some of the school buildings are, they may have to abandon them. And if you go visit them, the schools, the buildings themselves look pretty good. They were, they were well built. They rode out the earthquake, but the ground underneath them sh shifted so much. There was liquefaction and settling that the entire plumbing system underground was just, you know, sort, sort of racked in a way that's going to be very hard to fix. So building codes, modern building codes, don't aim for a building to be, uh, to come through an earthquake unscathed. The point of the modern building codes is to guarantee life safety. 
that we don't want buildings to collapse on people. Um, but they can still sustain some damage. Was there anything about Silmar that surprised you or something that maybe, you know, when you think about the Silmar quake, it's an aha moment? The, the aha moment, um, looking back, was, was the, the level of shaking that it generated, the fact that you could actually generate 1.7 G in an earthquake. Um, that's got to have been the big surprise. But like, is there anything you've learned, we've learned since that we are not quite prepared for? And also it's been a while since we've had a major earthquake. Um, I'm assuming we should be, ex I mean, I live uh, in Pasadena myself and it's like, I know I've gotten complacent. You know, since, since Northridge, that was the last big urban disaster we've seen in, in, the, in the contiguous US. Um, since then, there's been an, a lot of work done on computer models, computer programs that predict how the ground's going to shake. If we have a repeat, say, of the 1857 earthquake magnitude 7.8, you know, what's going to happen in Los Angeles? So there's been a lot of work done, um, very sophisticated to, to predict that, sh that level of, of shaking and what it could do to, say, modern high-rise buildings. Uh, but the thing is, in, in seismology, you know, we have our predictions and then the earth comes along and shows us what, it, what it's really going to do and how the buildings are going to respond. So I, we've learned a lot, but there's probably still some surprises out there that we're going to learn in, in the future earthquakes. Um, it is, yeah, you, earthquakes are infrequent relatively on, on human Time scales, you know, they just don't happen all that often. Night is really sobering to realize. 1994 was before an awful lot of people in in California were even born, or they have no memory of it, so they haven't been through a significant earthquake. You start to you, know, you have enough other things in your life to worry about, especially now. So, you know, earthquake preparedness stops seeming like the most important priority for a lot of people until the earth comes unglued at 4.31 or 6 in the, mor in, in the morning or 6 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon. Um, and then all of a sudden, everything, everything comes crashing down. So um, there has been a lot of preparedness work done behind the scenes. I think it's the good news for California. Uh, Northridge spurred a lot of action. Uh, Caltrans had a major program to retrofit their overpasses and their bridges. Um, I think pretty much all of them in the state. So where you saw like the I-10 collapse, um, the, there's been retrofitting done to try to prevent that in future earthquakes. Um, the, the building codes have been, um, have been strengthened again. So, and, and various utilities have been at work behind the scenes um, to think ahead about you know, what's going to happen to, to lifelines. So there has been a lot of, of preparedness work, um, work that's done, which is, which is the good news. And if, you, if, you've got to, if you've got to live in earthquake country, California is not a bad place to be because the level of, of preparedness is better than, better than a lot of places. Um, at the same time, there's, there's still more that people can do, that governmental agencies can do. We, we try to encourage people to, to be aware and, and prepared to the basic message to duck, cover, and hold on is you know, what we want to have seared in people's minds if, if they start to feel shaking. Back in 71, I think people were told to run, into, run to the doorway, I think. And my husband's college roommate was in San Fernando in 71, and he said, they don't tell you that the doorway is a moving target if the earthquake is that bad. And so since then, professionals have realized that, no, we don't, you don't want to run to the doorway because you don't want to try to run when the ground is shaking. You want to duck down, cover. If you can get under a table or a desk, great. If you can't, 
cover your head. Don't try to go anywhere. In California, buildings are, are very unlikely to collapse on you. Other parts of the world, it may be a different story. But we know that it's, it's actually dangerous to try to run, to try to go outside. So just that basic messaging, if you feel the ground shake, drop, cover, hold on, uh, can really make a difference for people. Uh, what you do within your, 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 your own walls in your own home can make a difference if you're prepared to, to be on your own, if you know, you've taken some basic steps to secure your own living space. The bookcases behind me are, are bolted to the wall. Um, the books may fly out. I, I really should have some bungee cords across the, across the shelves. But just securing bookcases, um, thinking about what's on the wall above your bed, that kind of thing, it really can make a big difference when an earthquake happens um, for your safety and your family's safety.